I just want to speak a bit about the resurrection and uh, I trust that as we contemplate what it means, uh, it will inspire your faith and encourage you. The resurrection of Jesus is the rock on which we build our Christian faith, is the foundation of the Christian faith. Of course, the early church did not have an Easter celebration as we have now. The early church, in the very first years of the church, there was nothing like an Easter celebration uh, once a year. Uh, the church, of course, acknowledged that Jesus uh, was crucified around the time of the Passover. So the Passover feast of the Jews and the resurrection, death and resurrection of Christ always worked together. But there was nothing like an Easter Sunday morning or resurrection annual event. And the reason was very simple. Because the church, early church, considered every Sunday a resurrection morning. So instead of having a once a year Easter service, they were having 52 Easter services. Every Sunday, the first day of the week, they will go to church to remember the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they did it every week after week. Now it has become a tradition that Christians worship on Sunday. And we forget that every Sunday when we meet, we are celebrating the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. But in time, the church added the Passover period and the resurrection that uh, came out as a Christian celebration. And that's why once a year we have Easter. But remember, before the next Easter uh, celebration, every Sunday is Easter. Every Sunday is a resurrection Sunday morning. I've titled my message, The Resurrection Fact and Fulfillment. The Resurrection Fact and Fulfillment. So what I'm going to focus on today is to show that the resurrection was a fact. And not only was it a fact, it was also a fulfillment of something that God had promised. So what is a fact? When we say something is a fact, what do we mean? A fact is something known and proven to be true. So when we say that the resurrection is a fact, it means that it is known and proven to be true. It is known and proven to be true. The early Christians knew the resurrection of Jesus was real because Christ proved it to them. The resurrection is a fact. It is not a metaphor. It is not an allegory. It is not something we just say to encourage ourselves. It is a fact. And when we say something is a fulfillment, it means that it is the achievement of something that is desired or promised. Something that is desired or promised. So the resurrection is a fact and the resurrection is a fulfillment. In the resurrection, a fact is established and a promise is fulfilled. So those are the two things I'm going to focus on in my message today. So let's get to our main text, uh, and it's not going to come from the Gospels, interestingly. It's going to come from the book of Acts, chapter 13, and verses 28 to 32. Now, if you know your Bibles well, which I suppose you do, uh, in Acts, chapter 13, from verse 1, Paul and Barnabas were separated to go and preach the gospel. So Paul and Barnabas uh, went out to preach the gospel. Now they went many places to preach the gospel and at this time they have moved through several places. They came through uh, Pegas and then they came to Antioch in Pisidia. And in Antioch in Pisidia, Paul started preaching. And this is the first recorded words of the preaching of the Apostle Paul. So it's so important for us to know what he was preaching about, what message was he talking about. So he's talking to the Jews and he's talking to them about Jesus Christ and his resurrection. 
I'm going to escape much of what he said and we're just going to focus on verses 28 to 32. And Paul is recounting what had happened and says, and though they found no cause for death in him, they asked Pilate that he should, put, he should be put to death. Now when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And he was seen for many days by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses to the people. And we declare to you glad tidings that promise which was made to the fathers. That's the message that Paul is preaching. Now you have to understand that the apostle Paul was not a follower of Jesus when Jesus was alive. Paul, uh, we don't know whether he physically knew Jesus, but after Jesus died, he became a persecutor of Christians. So this is not somebody who was there to physically see Jesus uh, either dead or resurrected. Paul was opposed to Jesus. But now he's speaking. And, and, and he's speaking about 13 years after Jesus had died and resurrected. Because Paul came to know Jesus Christ about three years after Christ had died. After Stephen had been martyred and, and then later he got saved. So that's about three years after the resurrection. At the time he's speaking is 10 years after his conversion. So if you put it together, this is about 13 years after the facts and the events of the resurrection have occurred. And this is very important. It's like somebody who is speaking now in 2022 about something that happened 13 years will be when? 29, 2009. So 2009 something happened. 2022, he's recounting it. So it's still quite close to the event. And Paul is saying that there are witnesses to what happened. So at the time Paul is speaking, 13 years after the fact, there are witnesses to all the events that he's talking about. And in Paul's teaching, this is what he says about Jesus Christ. The first fact he raises about Jesus Christ is that he really died. Jesus really died. The death of Jesus Christ was real. It was real to the disciples. It was real to those who were there. And for even Paul, who came to know Christ three years later, he knew by the report of the eyewitnesses that Jesus really died. Now, we may... We may I think, oh, that's not a major point. But it's a major point. Because until you believe he really died, you cannot believe he really resurrected. The death of Jesus Christ was real. And the apostle John, in John chapter 19, verse 30 to 34, talks about the account of the death. And I'll just read uh, a few of the verses. Verse 30. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Verse 33. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. Just in that statement alone, three statements affirming that Jesus really died. First, John says, Jesus said, it is finished. And he gave out the spirit. But how can we know he's really dead? Maybe he didn't die. Maybe he fainted. Maybe he's in a coma. So John says, well, Jesus died because he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Then John says, the soldiers came around because it's getting to evening and those days crucifixion was not a one day affair. Crucifixion sometimes would take about a week. It takes about a week, sometimes three days to a week before people die. So in order for those who have been crucified not to run away, they break their legs and bring them back on the cross the next day. So John said, well, Jesus died. How do I know? Because he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. 
But not only that, the people who were coming to break legs came and realized he was dead. So that's the second statement to show that he's dead. And then to make it sure, third proof, not only that Jesus gave up his spirit, not only that the people thought he was dead, they actually took a spear and pierced his side to prove that he's dead, dead, dead. The death of Jesus Christ was beyond any shadow of doubt. He gave up his spirit, he died, and he was killed after he died. A spear was pierced on his side. So if you were John, you would know without any shadow of doubt that Jesus is dead. That's why it was difficult for them to imagine the resurrection. The death they could believe because they saw it or they heard it. But the resurrection was an impossibility for them. They struggled with it because they were so certain he died. Second fact that Paul brings about is that Jesus not only died, but Jesus was buried. He wasn't stolen by the disciples. He wasn't taken to India. He didn't go somewhere else. He was buried. And the burial ground of Joseph of Arimathea was very close to Calvary, just a few meters. So if Jesus was um, killed probably somewhere on, over there at the end of the auditorium, the grave would be somewhere here. So it wasn't like they took the body and went to search for a, a burial place at Awudome or somewhere else. The grave was very, very close. Jesus was buried. And buried is important. It means that they acknowledge that he was not coming back. Matthew chapter 27, verse 20, 57 to 66 talks about it. But I'll just read a few verses from 59. It says, when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in clean linen cloth and laid it in his new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock, rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. But that wasn't sufficient for, for the record. Verse 20, 56, Pilate said to them, you have a guard, go your way, make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. Now, one of the things you, are, you, you would notice about all the events of Jesus, there were double layers of assurance at every level. In his death, double layers of assurance, or three layers. In his burial, many layers. First, Joseph of Arimathea took him, put him in his tomb, sealed the tomb, one layer. Pilate says that's not enough because the Jews want to complain that, hey, this guy, we have to be careful he doesn't come out. So second layer, seal the tomb. Third layer, put a guard there. So at every level, there are layers happening. Layers to his death, layers to his burial. Jesus really died. Jesus was really buried. Fact number three. Jesus really rose again from the dead. He really rose from the dead. This is where people stumble. And how do we know? Well, Jesus showed himself to many people. The disciples of Jesus were normal people like us. You know, sometimes we think, oh, these disciples were, were different. They were normal people like us. If you go to bury somebody at Osu Cemetery and later some women come and they say, we went to Osu today and the grave is empty. They'll say, oh, grave looters. Grave looters. They'll say, no, 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 no. We saw him. And an angel said, he's risen. Oh, yeah, women, who can believe them? So even Peter couldn't believe it. John couldn't believe it. Nobody could believe it. There were normal people like us. It is not easy to believe that a dead man has resurrected. It is against the laws of nature. It's against the facts of life. 
So the disciples were not eager looking for a resurrection. They were eager looking for death. The women who went to the tomb and on the morning of the resurrection, they weren't going to inspect the resurrection. They were going to bury him again and bomb his body. The resurrection is not easy to believe. But Jesus really resurrected. And one of the most important proofs is in John chapter 20, verse 27, 24 to 29. But I'll read verse 25 and verse 27. And the other disciples therefore said to him, they sent to this guy called Thomas, we have seen the Lord. And he said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. That is a normal human response. An intelligent man's response. A scientist's response. An empiricist's response. He doesn't just believe anything. Hey, he's risen. Okay, let's go to obey his risen. No, 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 no. Don't just say, hey, wait a minute. I'm not a fool. I'm not a fool. I'm not going to sit here for you guys to tell me something that is not real. And I don't care whether it's the majority saying. I don't care whether Peter says or John says it or Bartholomew says it. I don't care what you say. I don't care whether his mother says he's alive. It doesn't make sense. He was speaking for all of you. <laughs> we are all Thomases. Because the reason Thomas said that was he didn't see it. And Thomas is so important for us because all of us who have come to believe in Jesus, we didn't see him. We didn't see him die. We didn't see him resurrect. And Thomas is making our argument for us. Thomas says, I didn't see it. I can't believe it. Is that a reasonable excuse? Yes, it's reasonable. So Jesus came the second time, a week later. And he said to Thomas in verse 27, Reach your finger here. Look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my sight. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. <laughs> Thomas is the first person who addresses Jesus as God. Because that experience blew him away. And he, Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So Thomas, so look at the layers of the resurrection. The women at the tomb, the disciples who were the first to see Jesus on the night of the resurrection. The two men from Emmaus. And now Thomas, this is four layers of proof. Jesus comes and says to Thomas, Mr. Thomas, reach out your hand, touch my finger. Your finger, put it in my sight. We are not told from the scriptures whether Thomas actually did that. But what he saw was beyond anything he had ever imagined. And Jesus says, Thomas, it's good that you have seen and believed. But there are people coming after you who will just be like you. They will not see my resurrection. They will not see me dead. And I want you to know, although you, I gave you proof before you believe, the blessed ones, us, the blessed ones are coming. And they are not going to touch my side or see me alive, but they have to believe. Why did Jesus say that? Because how did Thomas know that Jesus was dead? How did he know? Because he heard it. Thomas was not at the grave, at the, at the cross. He wasn't there. He was one of those who ran away. He wasn't there. After Gethsemane, nobody saw Thomas. Probably went to his mother's house or his uncle's house. 
Nobody saw Thomas. The only people at the, at the cross who saw Jesus die is John, who recounts the gospel of John and the mother of Jesus. So they are the ones who came and said the guy was crucified. Nobody saw it. They are the ones who said the nails pierced his hand. They are the ones who said a spear went to his sword. Thomas never saw it, but he believed what he heard. Joseph of Arimathea, he saw the, blood, the wounds on Jesus. And I'm sure other people who went to prepare his body for burial said, hey, we saw the body. Hey, it's bad, it's bad. Hey, hey, we didn't think this would ever happen. Crown of thorns, with the, they have wounds all over his body, is torn into pieces. And there's a nail in his hand. And, you know, the soldiers just pierce his hand. There's a big wound by his side. Hi, it's bad. So, Sunday morning, we have to take extra herbs to go and prepare this body. Because what we saw is bad. All of this, Thomas didn't see it. How did Thomas believe Jesus was dead? By hearing. By hearing. And how was he supposed to believe that Jesus was alive? By hearing. The same people who said he was dead told him he's alive, but he chose what he would believe. He believed the death, didn't believe the resurrection. We are Thomases today. And we don't believe because we touch his side. We believe because very trustworthy eyewitnesses gave us a report and we believe he died you know there are people who say jesus died but he but he didn't resurrect and and he went to india and so and so you know silly stories and i said how how did you even get the first fact that he died well it's in the bible well wh what about the father he resurrected is it in the apocrypha if you can take one part of the truth why can't you take the other part of the truth from the same eyewitnesses? And that's what Jesus said to Thomas. There are people coming after you. They are not going to touch me. But they must believe me. Because of the report that has come to them. Just as the report came to you, I'm a dead. The same report comes, I'm alive. Do you believe Jesus is alive? I do. Do you believe he died? I do. Was I there? No. Did you ever see Kwame Nkrumah? Some of you didn't. Do you know there was a guy called Kwame Nkrumah? You know there was a guy called Nelson Mandela? Did you meet him? Did you touch him? Do you believe he existed? You believe he's died. How do you know? Somebody told you. And that's what Jesus is saying. Of course, the person who tells you must be credible. We all believe CNN. Although they, they don't tell the truth all the time. <laughs> Lord have mercy on them. But they report something. There's a war in Ukraine. Have you been to Ukraine? How do you know there's a war in Ukraine? You will stick your life on the war in Ukraine. Putin has started a war in Ukraine. Have you seen Putin? Do you know Putin? Do you know his mother? Have you shaken his hand? But you believe there is a guy called Putin. And he started a war in Ukraine. You have faith in it. Because somebody you believe told you. What about some people? who believed something and believed it so much that their heads were cut and they never changed their story. Do you think a CNN reporter will have his head cut and he won't change the story? They were sawn into two, they never changed the story. They were cut into two, they never changed the story. They were thrown to lions, they never changed the story. Their children were eaten by lions right in front of them, they never changed the story. I don't know about you, but I believe those people and their report more than I will believe any news report in contemporary times. 
That's the fact of the resurrection. What's the fulfillment? What was all of this for? I have a few minutes. Let me clear that. The fulfillment. What was this supposed to achieve? Luke chapter 24. Jesus Christ himself had to teach the scriptures to his disciples. Two of them on the road to Emmaus. And from verse 46. He said to them, thus it is written and thus is what is necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the third day. And that repentance and remissions of sin should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Thus it is written and thus it was necessary. What Jesus is saying is it was a fulfillment of something that has been said long ago. So the resurrection was not just the Romans having fun, the Jews being jealous, the Judas being a betrayer. That was all convenient. But it had to happen because a promise was made by Jehovah God Almighty. Thus it was written and thus it was fulfilled. It had to happen. It was necessary. Jesus in all promises in the Bible, the resurrection fulfilled the promises pointing to the Messiah. That Jesus is the promised Messiah. In Christ, all the Old Testament promises of a Redeemer, Savior, and Messiah are fulfilled. From his birth through to mystery, to death and resurrection, he fulfilled what was written about him. He fulfilled it. Not only that, Christ in his resurrection fulfilled what he said about himself. That he is who he said he was. What did he say? He said, I'm the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. I'm going to lay down my life for the sheep. I will be arrested. I will be betrayed. I will be arrested. I will be tortured. I will be crucified. I will die. I will resurrect. I don't know of any human being who can accurately predict the end of his life that way. But Jesus said it. And the resurrection proves that Jesus is truly who he says he is. He is the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. And the resurrection fulfilled all that was needed for our redemption. Jesus achieved what he set out to achieve. He atoned for the sin of the first Adam. He paid the price for the sins of the world. He's the final sacrifice offered for the redemption of the human race. That's the fulfillment. The fact and the fulfillment. And finally, there is a new promise. The resurrection of Jesus is a new promise. In the resurrection, Jesus is making a new promise to us. The promise made in the Old Testament has already been fulfilled. Now a new promise is being made to us in the New Testament. That there is life beyond death. Jesus came back to tell us the story. You know, many times he said, if somebody would just die and come and tell us what it is. Well, somebody died and told us what it is. We saw him. There is life beyond death. And for the Christian, there is life beyond death. That's the first promise. When you die, you would live. He that believes in me and dies shall live. And he that lives and believes in me shall never die. That's what Jesus said. It's life beyond death. So he gives us a promise of life beyond that. Secondly, 
the second promise is that the life beyond death is real. Look at the resurrection of Jesus. He didn't forget things when he resurrected. His mind wasn't blank. The disciples could make him out. He could make out the disciples. He could carry on a conversation. He could recognize who was who. Other religions talk about a resurrection in abstract forms. It's as if you lose yourself and you become a drop in water. You become part of the universe. Like the circle of life in the Lion King. That is not Christianity. It's not the circle of life. It's not becoming part of the universe. It's not becoming part of nature. In Jesus' resurrection, he was a personal, individual person. In the resurrection, we don't mix up with the elements. We have a unique life. We have a unique life. Your memories will be activated. You will know who was your brother, who was your sister. You will know your mother. You will know your father. You will know your brothers. You will know your sisters. You will know your friends. How do I know? Because Jesus knew everybody. He knew Peter. He knew Thomas. He mentioned them by name. That is the nature of Christian resurrection. We don't become part of the universe. We become individuals alive in God. And unto him with the personality. And the final one. Jesus gives us the promise that those who believe in him will have eternal life. That's the big deal. Eternal life. Jesus says, you want to live after death? Believe me. You can do it on your own. Trust the person who went and came back. You want to live this quality of life after your death? Believe in me. And that's the promise he gives to us. The resurrection is a fact. It's a fulfillment. But it's also a new promise. In the resurrection, there is a new promise of life. And if you are a Christian, you have that assurance and that promise. And don't believe like, um, behave like unbelievers. Who believe when you die is blackness. After all, when you die, everything is over. Oh. Eh. Everything is over. Because you saw a lifeless body put into a grave. You say everything is over. No, 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 no. That is not what the Bible teaches. Jesus Christ himself said, there is a resurrection. Unfortunately, not everybody to a good one. Some will have a bad resurrection. They wish they were dead, but they won't be dead. Jesus calls it this way. They are worm dieth not. There is perpetual suffering. And there is no redemption from it. You can say, I don't believe in it. Do I care whether you believe in it or not? The big guy himself is telling me, between you and Jesus, whom should I believe? You, you got a PhD, you got degrees. You can't even predict what is going to happen to you right after this minute. And the guy who could predict everything, including his death, and what will happen when he was dead, and what will happen after he's dead. If he tells me he's coming again, I should look at it and say, ah, how can I believe that? Are you logical or illogical? The logic of life favors Jesus Christ. I said the logic of life favors Jesus Christ and what he says and what he promised. So today, if you are in this place and you don't have Jesus in your heart, he has not come to live inside your heart. You're not born again. You're not a child of God through Christ. You say, oh, I believe what I want to believe. Well, it's not like that. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Does he have the credentials to back that audacity? Of course he does. And if he's not in your heart, you have no life. You may have education, you may have money, but you have no life. You may have degrees, but you have no life. You may have all the worldly pleasures, but you have no life. So this morning, before I sit down, 
I'm going to give you the opportunity to invite Jesus into your heart as your Lord and your Savior. Let's all bow down our heads. And if you are here, you say, Pastor, I heard all of this. I don't even know whether I have Jesus or not. I don't know whether he's in my heart or not. Well, if you are not sure, then be sure. I'm going to give you the chance to be sure. You say, Pastor, but I prayed something like that some time ago, but you know, my life is now a mess. I'm not really sure whether Jesus truly is in my heart. Then you have to be sure. Or somebody says, I've never prayed this prayer before. Whichever category you find yourself, if the, today you want Jesus to be your Lord and personal Savior, I'm going to ask you to do something very simple, but it has eternal consequences. If you want Jesus as your Lord and Savior, lift up your right hand wherever you are. Lift up your hand. Lift up your hand. Let your hand go up. Let your hand go up. In the wherever, whether you're in the auditorium or you are outside the auditorium, wherever you are seated, in the balconies, wherever you are, lift up your hand. And if you lifted up your hand, I'm going to ask you to do something. The second thing, just stand up wherever you are. Stand up. Get up from your seat and stand up. Just stand up. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. And those of you standing, I want you to put your hand upon your heart. And we're going to pray together. And I want the whole church to join us in this prayer as we invite Jesus to come in. Say with me, Heavenly Father, I come to you today just as I am. I am a sinner. I cannot save myself. I thank you, Father, that Jesus came and died for me and he rose again from the dead to give me life. And today, I accept him as my Lord and my Savior. I thank you, Jesus, for accepting me and making me a child of God. I thank you today in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Give the Lord praise, somebody. Thank you.